Good afternoon. I'm Nicole Trurog, Associate Director of the Center for Financial Security at UW-Madison. Welcome to today's webinar on payday lending. This webinar is part of the Family and Financial Security webinar series sponsored by a grant from the UW-Madison School of Human Ecology Beckner Endowment. Our presenter today is Justin Sidner, Center for Financial Security affiliate and assistant professor in the Department of Actuarial Science, Risk Management, and Insurance at the Wisconsin School of Business. Our discussants are Joshua Sledge, Analyst, Innovation and Research at the Center for Financial Services Innovation, and Ray Allen, Deputy Secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Financial Institutions. Just a quick housekeeping item before we get started. If you have any technical difficulties, please call 1-800-442-4614. To submit questions for the Q&A portion of the webinar, locate the dark gray bar near the top of media site Click on the Ask a Question icon and a window will open. Please type your name, email address, and your question and hit send. With that, I'll turn it over to Justin. All right. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you all for tuning into our webinar today. Uh, I'm going to lead off the presentation today by talking about some preliminary research I've been doing. This is joint with a couple of co-authors, Susan Carter and uh, Paige Skiba, who are both at Vanderbilt University. Paige is a professor of law and economics at Vanderbilt, and Susan is a PhD student in economics on the job market this year. Uh, the question we're looking at in this paper is we're asking what happens when a payday loan borrower gets a longer time to repay their payday loan. And I'll, pres I'll show you some preliminary evidence we have on that. After I talk about that really very focused research question, I'll turn it over to Joshua and Ray, who are going to give a broader perspective on their insights, what they're seeing in sort of uh, in terms of alternatives to payday loans in the credit market and also the regulatory landscape uh, for these things. So if you're tuning in today, I probably don't need to tell you that payday lending is highly controversial. And... I think that controversy really reflects sort of two different perspectives on the role of payday lending in credit markets. So the good, which I have highlighted here on the slide, is the sort of green box, is the idea that payday lending may provide quick and accessible credit to those who really need it. And it helps people to avoid potentially bouncing checks and being laid on a range of utility bills. And from this perspective, we think about people who are very rational and happen to be facing a temporary slow down in their income or a shock to spending that they need, and payday loans fill a gap in their credit needs. On the alternative perspective, and one that's often sort of put forth by consumer advocates, is the idea that payday loans may actually do more harm than good. And this perspective tends to start from the observation that these loans, although they sort of have potentially modest amounts of interest when you think about them initially, they have very high annualized percentage rates that come from the fact that if you roll over these loans consistently, the APR can be in the couple of hundred percent. And uh, we observe many people do roll these loans over. And so from this perspective, you might think of payday loans as essentially a dangerous product for people who have self-control problems or generally chronic problems with budgeting. And that access to payday loans may lead them to a debt spiral and they'd be better off without them. And, you know, really this is sort of an open question in much of this literature. And this sort of tension between these two views of payday lending, and, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. For some people they can be very beneficial and for others they can be harmful, is reflected in regulations that vary quite a bit. So there are some states that, about a dozen states, that ban payday lending effectively altogether and a few states where there's essentially no regulation at all. And while there's been a lot of research trying to get at this very tricky question of what happens if you ban payday loans outright, most states and most of the sort of regulatory issues are looking at a sort of more middle ground, an approach that tries to limit some of the downsides of payday lending while still leaving them accessible. And at this point, there's not a lot of hard research or sort of facts to help inform those discussions. And so what you can see on this slide here is I've put together a spectrum of how you might think about the various regulatory tools. So on the strongest side, you might ban payday loans or you might cap the interest rates that they can be charged on those loans. But there are weaker versions of this that might address some of the concerns with payday loans, which include things like limiting the number of rollovers or renewals people can do of the loans, and also things like limiting the duration, putting a minimum to the duration or the loan length. And that's really this sort of what I consider potentially the weakest or easiest of the regulations is the focus of our study today. 
So what we're interested in asking the, answering the question is, what happens when you give somebody a longer time to pay a payday loan? And we're really going to be interested in asking that question if we could hold all else equal. And there are really two things you could think of that this might do. The first is that it should lower the effective interest rate on a loan. So if you take a loan and you keep the same interest charge, but you give people a longer time to repay, that lowers the annual cost of borrowing. But there's a second thing, and something kind of inherent to a lot of people thinking about doing these regulations, is that it may also help reduce the frequency of rollovers, this idea that people get into a pattern and just keep rolling over the loan rather than repaying it and end up paying high interest. And the idea is that if you have more time to repay the loan, you're more likely to be able to save the money and actually pay it off. And what you can think of is that this really interacts with these two stories we have for what's going on with payday lending. If the sort of good side of payday lending is really dominating, what we have is we have people who are facing a temporary shock and are trying to deal with that shock. And if you give those people a longer time to repay their loan, they're much more likely to have the ability to save the money and get it repaid. Alternatively, though, if what we're seeing is a lot of chronic borrowing driven by issues such as self-control problems or inattention to budgets, it's not at all obvious that having a longer time to repay is going to have any fundamental effect on people's ability to repay and avoid a continued pattern of rollovers of these loans. And so for that reason, we think this is a really interesting empirical question, both because as a policy issue, we want to know what happens if we give people a longer time, but we also think this may help us learn a little bit about these two differing perspectives. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you about is a very specific research project that we've undertaken to try to answer this. Uh, we're taking a couple of different approaches. I'm going to tell you about one specific approach that we're taking within this research today, and then potentially we can touch on some other things later. Uh, so to give you an overview of our data set, we're using data that was provided by a large payday lending company that operates in a number of states. And what we have is information on all of the transactions at their stores between 2002 and 2004. And so for each of those transactions, we know basically everything the payday lender knew about the borrowers. We also see all the contract the features, the loan terms, and whether or not somebody ends up repaying that loan and whether they roll it over. So what we'd ideally like to have is this perfect experiment where some people get a shorter loan and some people get a longer loan, and it's just randomly assigned, a nice classic experiment. Unfortunately, for our purposes, that experiment just doesn't really exist. And so what we are trying to do is isolate that question in other ways. So for part of our research, we're trying to look at changes in state regulations about loan lengths and those sort of things. That, that can be a little tricky. For what I'm going to tell you about today, instead what we're doing is we're focusing on the fact that in states that have a minimum duration, and in our case we're going to look at states where the loans have to be at least seven days in length, for some people that regulation is going to be binding. And, for, and will affect how long their loan is, and for other people it may not. And so we're going to try to exploit that to get this sort of experiment. So for this study, I'm going to be focusing on a reduced sample of this big sample of payday loans we have, where I'm going to be looking only at customers who are taking out what we would call a new loan. So these are people who are either taking out their first loan ever from this company, or who at least haven't had a loan active for three months, 90 days. And then I'm going to focus on states where they do allow rollovers, because we're interested in whether the people keep rolling over the loans. I'm going to focus on states where the minimum length of a loan is seven days. And this results in 184,000 observations that we use for this study. So let me quickly characterize the data for you a bit. And I think it can be useful, actually, to just step back and look a little bit about what payday loan borrowers actually look like. So the average borrower in our data set is 37 years old. 70% of them turn out to be female, although we're missing some gender information for a few people, so it may be a little closer to 50-50. 20% own their own home. The average person has been in wherever they're living for about five years. And they have annual take-home pay. So we, take, we get that from looking at their paychecks and extrapolating it to an annual paycheck of $22,000. So these people are lower income, but they're certainly not below the poverty line. They're not uh, extremely low income individuals. And 73% of them have direct deposits. So they, they are banked. And the way you do a payday loan is you write a personal check from your banking account. So this is not the unbanked population. Now, the average loan we observe, which you can see on the right side of the screen here, is a $284 loan. There's some variation around that, but the average is 284 The average interest rate is $51, or 18%. 
And the average person has 14 days to repay, which translates into an APR of 468%. So our outcome of interest is really going to be what happens for this first loan that people pay, take out. Do they repay that loan on time at the when it's due? Do they roll it over, essentially generating another $50 interest charge? Or do they default on the loan, which generally means that they've let their bank account really run out of funds? And what you see is this graph shows the overall fractions of those different outcomes in our data set. So roughly 40% of people repay that first loan. Okay. A slightly higher fraction roll it over. So we do see there are a lot of these rollovers. But there's a mix between people who repay that first loan and a, a fraction who renew. And then we've got a little bit over 10% of people who default on that first loan. Okay. Now, our question of interest is how these outcomes are affected by the length of time somebody has to repay the loan. Mostly we're going to use this sort of slightly experimental style variation I was mentioning before. But before we do that, let me just give you one general picture of what this looks like. So here I'm focusing on borrowers in these states who have bi-weekly pay periods. So these are people who are paid every other week. And I'm looking at the result of their first loan. And on the x-axis here, I have how long that first loan was, how long they had to repay. And it goes from a minimum of seven days because of the minimum seven-day regulation, to as much as 20 days for these people. So they could have as much as essentially two and a half pay periods to pay. Um, what you see here, I think, when you look at this graph is that the green bars show you the repayment, the yellow is the renewing, and the red is default. There is no really strong trend here. So there's no obvious trend. Uh, there's some slight movement of these various things. But essentially, that fraction repaying the loan stays pretty close to 40% whether we're talking about a seven-day loan or a 20-day loan. Now, as I said, we can do a little bit better than that. So let me describe our empirical strategy. So what we do is we focus on when this regulatory minimum of seven days becomes binding. So here I'm showing you a graph that shows how long someone will have to repay the loan as a function of how long it is until their next paycheck for our borrowers who get paid every other week on a Friday. So on the x-axis, we have days until your next paycheck. So the first blue dot there at negative 14 shows somebody who comes in 14 days before their next paycheck. So that's essentially somebody who comes in on a Friday when they get paid. And then they'll get paid two weeks later on another Friday. So that person has 14 days to repay their loan when they get paid in their next paycheck. And if you come in 13 days before your next paycheck, so you come in that Saturday, you get 13 days to repay, and so on. Now, as you get to the Friday, just bef in between pay periods, that dot there before the vertical line, what you see is people have seven days to repay. However, if you come in one day later, if you're six days before your next paycheck, you come in that Saturday, you're going to have a 20-day loan. It won't be due until the following paycheck. And that's a 13-day increase in how long people have to pay the, pay the loan back. And so really our empirical strategy for the part I'm going to tell you about today is to focus on that difference. What happens for those people who we think are probably otherwise fairly similar, whether they happen to come in on a Friday or Saturday in the week between their paychecks. And we're going to look to see whether that extra 13 days has a big effect on whether or not they're able to repay the loan. Okay. Now, before we can do that, we have to have some sense that these people are similar. If we thought that the people who come in Saturday are very different than the people who come in Friday, it's not a particularly good research strategy. And so these graphs are meant to show you what differences on observable characteristics we see between these groups. We've done this for a number of other characteristics, but we think these are probably the most important ones. So in the upper left-hand graph, you see the number of observations for each of these days. And the blue line there marks that division between people who come in seven days before or six days before. So this is Friday, Saturday borrowers. What you can see is that there's roughly the same number of people in our data set who came in that Friday and who came in on a Saturday. So we're not seeing a massive spike in the number of people coming in on Saturdays, uh, which we might worry about if we thought that most people were gaming this and waiting until they could get the longest possible loan. We can also look at more objective criteria that go into the, the loan uh, characteristics that payday lenders look at. So in the upper right, we see the credit score. So this is an average credit score. And these aren't FICO scores. These are a subprime credit score. So you can't interpret this the way you might your bank credit score. But what you see here is that there's really no difference between the people at any of these days that they come in on their average credit scores. You can also see that loan amounts, while they dip a little bit uh, in the sort of week running up to somebody getting a paycheck, 
there's not very much difference and really a very, very tiny difference between people who come in six or seven days before. And similarly, when we look at the biweekly paycheck amount, they average in the high 800s on their biweekly net paychecks, and it doesn't differ on this. So the main takeaway from this set of graphs is that it looks like these people are probably fairly similar. Now on this graph, what I'm doing is I'm just showing that same x-axis on the days until the next paycheck. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the fraction of people who repay that first loan. Okay, this is, again, biweekly borrowers paid on Fridays. And that blue line shows us the division between seven days and six days before, where we see that 13-day jump in the loan lengths. And what you can see is that there is a small, but it, it's really quite modest, difference between the dots on either side of that blue line. So 40% of the people who get seven-day loan lengths are repaying their loans. And 44% of the people who come in a day later and get a 20-day loan length repay their loan. Now, we can also do this if you're worried a little bit about Friday-Saturday effects, what sort of person comes into a payday loan on a Saturday. We can also do this with biweekly borrowers whose paychecks are paid on Thursdays. So now we've got the same graph, only here the difference comes between whether you come on the Thursday between paychecks or the Friday between paychecks. But otherwise, the strategy is the same. And we can do the same types of graphs to check whether these people look similar. The only place where this really looks a little different is if you look on the number of observations. Here, we do have to worry a little bit that uh, the people who come in six days before, meaning the people who come in on Fridays in this case, there are more of those people. There's a jump there on the right side of the blue threshold line relative to the number who come in on those Thursdays. Now, we think by looking at other things in our data set that most of this has to do with the fact that Fridays are fairly popular payday loan days to begin with. Uh, but we do have to worry a little bit about that. So part of our research is trying to take many, many different cuts at this. Okay? But on all the other observable characteristics we have about people, credit scores and loan amounts and their biweekly paychecks, whether the person came in on seven days or six days before for these Thursday uh, paycheck people doesn't seem to be any real difference. So again, we conclude that these people look pretty similar on either side of the threshold. And again, when we look at what happens to whether they repay on either side of this threshold, we see very little difference. So if we focus on these two dots on either side, 42% repay when they, have, when they come in seven days before their next paycheck, and 44 when they come in six days. Now, so far, I've focused only on borrowers who are paid every other week. We can, and that you know, generates this dynamic that could be unique to borrowers who have every other week paychecks. There are Thursday, Friday, Saturday effects that we might worry about. So here, what we're doing is I'm showing you some results we have where we're looking instead at borrowers who are paid semi-monthly. So these are people who generally are paid either on the first or second of the month, and almost always on the 15th of the month, provided that the 15th doesn't fall on a Sunday. So what you have for these types of borrowers is that around the eighth day of the month, whenever that happens to fall, the eighth day of the month creates this threshold where many of these borrowers, because they get paid on the 15th, run into this seven-day minimum cap. And so what you can see here is if you look at the blue line, that uh, the first threshold line we have here, I'm showing you days of the month on the x-axis. And between the eighth and ninth day of the month, there's a change from an average loan length of nine days to an average loan length of 18 days. So there's an increase of nine days here for these people. And then we have a, another jump or a sort of a trend break in the uh, days they get to repay the loan that happens around the 23rd, 24th day of the month that comes from the paychecks that come on the first or second. Now, this one's a little messier because not everyone's paid right on the first. Um, and there are some issues with 30 or 31 days. But here we have two of these thresholds we can try to look at. Now, again, we can do the same sort of analysis to try to see whether borrowers on either side of the thresholds look similar. And here, on all of these measures, what you can see is that the borrowers really do look very similar. The number of observations doesn't jump wildly on either side of the threshold. The credit scores are very flat throughout here. Loan amounts and paychecks are not varying in any very strong way across these things. So again, we conclude that it looks like the borrowers on either side are pretty similar. And again, if we look at the fraction of repayment, we see very little movement here, only a percentage point or so for the first threshold and maybe about four to five percentage points on the second threshold. Okay. So uh, this is to show you the results we have from this part of our analysis. We're also doing it in a number of different ways. Uh, but so far, in everything we've looked at, what we're finding is really a very small effect of longer loan durations on the probability of repayment. And our best estimate is that each week, 
longer somebody has to repay their loan increases the probability of repaying that first loan by one or two percentage points. Okay? So it's not, it's not nothing, but it's also not massive. Uh, so we think this is a useful result for people interested in thinking about these policies, but we also think it sheds some somewhat direct light on some of these theories of the loan demand. And in particular, the lack of response we see to these longer loan durations suggests to us that these theories that suggest that people have chronic problems with debt are probably likely to be relevant for the people who are renewing their loans. Okay? So the people who repay their loans the first time may very well be these borrowers who are using this to deal with a very temporary shock. But because we don't see very much response to longer loan durations among the borrowers who had been renewing, or uh, to say it a little better, because we don't see much impact on renewal behavior from having longer loan durations. We think that seems probably most consistent with some of these stories that suggest people have chronic problems with debt, rather than that they're using this as one, uh, an ability to overcome a temporary shock. Um, and we think this has a pol some policy implications. So the first policy implication is we think that the case for longer minimum durations as a policy issue really rests on the ability of those longer durations to help lower the annual costs of borrowing. Okay? And that's something in our study we can't say very much about. We're focused only on those first things. But that part of the policy still has bite. However, as a policy for dealing with rollovers and renewals, it doesn't look like this is very powerful. And in some ways that's important because you might have thought that longer loan durations could be a very nice policy because unlike trying to, for instance, limit rollovers directly, you can enact this policy pretty broadly without a lot of regulatory oversight. Monitoring rollover behavior instead requires you to check whether each loan is being rolled over, track them individually, and also compare across stores. So you need to know that someone is not paying off one loan by taking out one at a different store. Um, so there are reasons why, as a policy, longer loan durations might have been an attractive way of dealing with this propensity of people to roll over these loans. But it, from our results, it looks like it's not going to have a lot of impact there. Okay. So now let me turn, turn things over to Joshua who is going to give, his, give us his perspective on sort of a broader perspective on what's going on uh, for access to short-term credit. Sure. Thanks, Justin. Appreciate it. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. I think maybe on a little bit of a delay here, but... Um, yeah, no, thanks again to Nicole and Justin and the entire Center for, for Financial Security for the opportunity to uh, speak with you all today. Um, Justin, just want to say, you know, this type of research that you're working on is, is really instrumental in helping us to understand how people are using small dollar credit. And it's also just very, very valuable as we try to think through uh, how to design effective products and policy in order to provide borrowers with safe and responsible credit products that can really help them to achieve uh, better financial outcomes. So I was very interested to see some of the, the research that you were putting forward there. Um, what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes talking about the developing landscape of payday loan alternatives. Um, innovation in small dollar credit products has really been an area of particular interest for CFSI and, and our research agenda. Um, we really think that by looking at the development and, and emergence of new products, uh, we really hope to find a pathway toward the creation of more and uh, better, high-quality, sustainable loan products um, that consumers can, again, use safely to, to manage their financial lives. So there are a number of alternative products that have emerged in the marketplace recently. Uh, they're all slightly different, but uh, for the purposes of our discussion today, I've roughly bucketed them into the, the following categories. So you have uh, financial institutions, small-dollar loan programs, uh, also, uh, direct deposit advance products, and then uh, a number of alternatives that are being introduced from emerging companies. Um, so I'd like to walk through and take a closer look at each of these categories, but uh, before I do that, I want to emphasize that you know, many of these new products uh, that are out in the market are imperfect. Uh, and by that, I mean they really haven't found that balance between sustainability for the provider and quality for the consumer that we really hope to see. Uh, but in the innovation that we're seeing in this space, we're, we're seeing new strategies or product features that really, I think, offer us promise uh, for, for finding a direction to help us get there. Uh, so for each of the categories we go through, I'll focus a bit on some of those promising elements while also pointing out where uh, challenges or consumer risk may still remain. Um, so can we go to the next slide? 
All right. So the first category that I want to talk about are the small dollar loan programs that are typically offered by uh, financial institutions. Uh, so these are essentially modified personal loans that are uh, designed to serve the needs of a payday borrower. Um, so typically the loans are under or near $1,000, uh, which are much, much less than what many institutions would consider to be uh, the minimum for a more conventional personal loan. Uh, but it's much more closely aligned with that, you know, $300 to $500 need that might send someone to a payday lender. <clears throat> uh, so pricing for the loans are typically under the FDIC guideline of 36%, uh, and repayments are usually made in installments, which uh, theoretically can give the borrowers a much more manageable payment than what you see with a single payment balloon structure of a payday loan. Uh, many of the borrowers also, many of the programs also offer borrowers uh, some forms of supplemental assistance, so they may offer or in some cases even require that borrowers undergo financial counseling or attend financial education classes. Uh, we've also seen many programs wrap savings contributions into repayments, and I think this is pretty interesting. So uh, if you needed to pay, say, $75 a month to repay the loan, uh, the provider will actually set the repayment amount at $100. Uh, and after the loan is paid off, uh, you, know, you as the borrower would then receive access to a savings account with all those $25 monthly contributions in it. And the thought there is that once you retire the loan, you also have this uh, um, pool of funds, so the next time you have a financial emergency, you'll be able to handle it without having to borrow again. Um, so in terms of who is offering these products, uh, there are a number of credit unions and community banks that are offering some type of small dollar loan program, uh, though I wouldn't call it a particularly common practice. Uh, so most notably, the FDIC ran a pilot um, from 2008 to 2009 in which uh, 31 banks tracked the progress of their small dollar loan programs. Uh, that were all run under some general guidelines given from the FDIC, such as a 36% APR cap, 90-day terms as, as a minimum, and uh, most of the loans were under $2,500. So in total, under these pilots, you know, the banks loaned a little over $40 million uh, over the term, and they experienced some, some mixed results. Uh, in more recent days, the National Credit Union Association uh, created a new set of guidelines to encourage credit unions to offer some of these payday alternatives. Uh, so credit unions that are offering the products are, are now allowed to charge up to 28% in annual interest, uh, which is up from the general credit union lending cap of 18%, uh, and also, in addition, charge up to uh, $20, applica $20 in application fees um, for these types of products, as long as they meet a certain uh, criteria, such as uh, a minimum of a 30-day term, and, and the borrowers can have uh, no more than three loans in six months. So when we're looking at these products, uh, a couple of promising elements really jump out at you immediately. Uh, the flexibility offered by the installment structure and the low price points on these products offer borrowers a much better deal uh, and possibly offer a better chance of being able to repay the loan without having to constantly reborrow, you know, launching them into that, that cycle of debt. Uh, additionally, these loans can potentially serve as credit building opportunities uh, and also a starting point for a deeper relationship with a bank or credit union. Uh, however, a persistent challenge to the model really is profitability or, at the very least, sustainability. Uh, it's a difficult model to make work from a financial perspective. Uh, underwriting often requires significant efforts from loan officers and other members of the bank staff, and that can really consume a lot of research and put pressure on this low-pricing model. Uh, I think the fact that the NCUA raised its interest rate cap and allowed the application fee for these types of programs really speaks directly to that difficulty in uh, generating enough revenue to offset the, the expenses associated with uh, small-dollar loans. Uh, at the same time, a lot of the participants in the FDIC pilot also uh, noted that profitability was really a significant challenge. Now, this isn't to say that it's impossible to operate a sustainable small-dollar loan program, and in cases where it's not, you know, some institutions really find value in the possibility of building uh, longer-term customer relationships. Uh, but with profitability really being a challenge, scaling these programs um, can be difficult, uh, and it may be more difficult to get more institutions involved in, in offering the alternatives uh, if, if they don't think that they can operate them sustainably. Uh, can we go to the next slide? All right, the uh, next emerging category is the deposit advance product. Uh, so these loans are offered as an add-on product to checking or prepaid card accounts. Um, loans are generally limited to $500, some ranging up to 1000 uh, and they're offered to customers that hold a transaction account and also utilize uh, direct deposit. Uh, so these products are designed to let customers borrow against their future direct deposit payments. So, for instance, if my bank offered a deposit advance product, I could go in and request to borrow anywhere from, say, $20 to $500, depending on what I needed the money for. 
Uh, that money is in place right in my checking account that day, and the next time my, check, my paycheck is deposited into the account, uh, my bank will deduct the amount of the loan and the associated fee for borrowing. So these products have been around for a while, but uh, have developed and really expanded in recent years. Uh, a few years ago, the iAdvance direct deposit uh, advance product was offered as an add-on to a number of different prepaid cards, uh, but was ultimately shut down by the Office of Thrift Supervision, uh, who cited unfair, deceptive acts and practices uh, that were associated with the product. Uh, currently, we're seeing a number of large banks offering the deposit uh, advance products, including Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, uh, Regions, as well as uh, Fifth Third. Now, on the promising front, uh, these products really rely heavily on automated technical systems to do almost everything in the loan process- processing chain, uh, all the way from underwriting to distributing the funds and even collecting repayment. So because of that, providers gain some efficiencies by using these kind of automated technical systems, and that can really help to overcome some of those cost challenges that we saw uh, impeding um, uh, the the financial institution small dollar loan programs. Uh, At the same time, they're also um, almost exclusively offered by banks, so you have that same potential for uh, building or expanding a relationship between a bank and uh, potentially an underserved customer. But on the consumer side, there are uh, some notable challenges and risks. Uh, as they currently stand, many of these products have relatively high prices, uh, usually around $10 per 100 borrowed. Uh, additionally, they typically have the same short-term single repayment structure that uh, you might see with a payday loan, uh, which can add pressure on customers to have to then reborrow in order to um, fulfill their uh, monthly expenses. Uh, so the prices and repayment structures on the products have led many to note the similarities between these products and payday loans, uh, with many in the field uh, referring to deposit advanced, advanced products uh, as that, as bank payday loans. Uh, there are also concerns over the requirement of automatic repayment, which is a, a key feature here, um, as it gives the lender the ability to take repayment out of a borrower's paycheck before they're delivered. Um, so if these funds are withdrawn, you know, what does that mean for the borrower's ability to, to pay for necessities? Uh, could it lead to one or multiple overdrafts, and what does that mean for the customer? Uh, so overall, the field is seeing some significant concerns raised uh, over the emergence of the, the deposit advance products. Uh, the next slide. So this last category uh, is a bit of a catch-all, uh, but I want to highlight, really want to spend some time highlighting some of the innovative products that are being offered by young emerging companies uh, that are really working to build payday alternatives. So structurally, many of the products are, are very different, uh, but they're all designed with the underserved consumer in mind. Uh, interestingly, uh, most are developing new ways to underwrite loans in an efficient manner uh, that will allow the provider to gauge whether or not a loan is affordable for a borrower. And now, this can be tricky with the underserved segment, you know, many of whom may be thin or no-file consumers, meaning that they don't have sufficient credit histories to generate a reliable credit score, uh, or consumers may have damaged credit, perhaps as a result of the financial crisis. Uh, so being able to use non-traditional means to underwrite loans uh, is very important for serving the underserved. Uh, Another similarity between the different types of products is that many of the new providers are leveraging niche distribution strategies uh, in an effort to really try to find the right ways to be able to offer loans efficiently while still reaching the target uh, consumer. Uh, So, for example, uh, Progresso Financiero, a uh, provider offering small-dollar installment loans, uh, they offer their loans through kiosks in Hispanic grocery stores as well as freestanding retail outlets uh, in Hispanic neighborhoods to better serve their target market. Uh, several of the new providers have also turned the online channel, which allows them to avoid some of the, the high costs that are associated with maintaining a, a network of physical outlets. Uh, so two notable examples are Zescash, an online installment lender, uh, and Billflow, who offers short-term loans that are, which are used to pay utility bills uh, on behalf of borrowers. So finally, we're seeing experimentation in offering loans through employers, almost as an added employee benefit. Uh, So workers are able to take out small installment loans uh, with repayment automatically being deducted from their paychecks. So in that field, you see uh, Flex Wage, Symbius Financial, uh, and Emerge Financial Wellness are are all offering versions of this employer-linked credit model. Now, on the promising side, many of these new products are relatively low in price and offer either installment repayment structures or give the 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 borrower the option to choose the repayment schedule that works best for them, so giving them some, some flexibility. Uh, also, their work in developing underwriting systems for the underserved could prove to be extremely valuable uh, in the field's overall efforts to learn how best to serve uh, the underserved customer. Now, on the challenge side, scaling operations can be difficult for some of the newer providers. Um, as each state has its own unique set of laws and licensing requirements for lenders, 
uh, it can take some time and effort for non-bank providers to grow from state to state. Uh, for the employer model, getting employers to participate in loan programs is, is also proved to be a challenge. Many employers just don't want that level of involvement in their employees' financial lives. Uh, additionally, uh, because most of the providers are monoline providers, uh, there are fewer opportunities to use the loans as a starting point for a deeper customer relationship. Uh, basically, they just don't have another product to offer. Uh, now, this isn't necessarily a flaw in these new models, uh, but we really think those graduation opportunities could be valuable um, in, in helping borrowers to really affect their, their overall uh, financial lives. Uh, next slide. So that's just a quick snapshot at some of the innovation that we see uh, happening in the development of payday alternatives. There's a, a much fuller discussion to have, uh, but hopefully you know, that serves as, as a good overall background. So uh, quickly wrapping up here, I just want to say that in looking at the payday loan issue, uh, it's important to remember that small dollar credit can play a positive role in consumers' lives. Uh, it can help households to manage their short-term cash shortages, or if there's an emergency that they need to handle, they may have the funds available to do that. Um, and in the case when products feature credit reporting, it can really serve as a credit building opportunity which can uh, serve benefits for the consumer uh, down the line. Uh, however, we can't expect small dollar credit to play this positive role unless it's of high quality. Now, how do we define high quality? I think that's a, a discussion we should have to help us figure out really how to push and where to push the marketplace uh, in order to get it where we want it to go. Uh, at a high level, we really think it includes uh, the following factors we have here. It must be affordable and structured, structured to support repayment without having to borrow again. Uh, it should be marketed transparently and priced fairly. Uh, and ideally, we really like seeing those types of uh, products that also, also offer uh, um, savings opportunities, kind of link it with repayment of the credit, um, may offer tools for budgeting or other things that help people to, to manage their finances on a day-to-day -day basis, so are just offered in that larger context. Uh, so in closing, these new alternatives offer potential, uh, but we haven't arrived at where we want to be just yet. Uh, ultimately, I think we want consumers to have access to a variety of good, high-quality, small-dollar loan options, so that way they won't be forced into taking out the bad ones. Uh, that's in part the job of industry, but regulation and policy can also play a key role here by uh, finding ways to prevent abusive practices while encouraging the development of some of the more promising products and features. Now, it's obviously all much, much easier, said, easier to be said than done, um, so I think, uh, you know, we've definitely got a, a challenge uh, ahead of all of us here. Um, so with that, I'll now uh, turn it over to Ray. Well, for uh, um, their assistance in this important, I think, uh, uh, discussion on such an important public policy matter. I thought in my few minutes here I'd spend a little time just uh, talking about the the industry and the its evolution from a policy standpoint uh, and its effect on um, uh, the regulatory process. Um, next slide. In um, 1998, uh, the Consumer Federation of America published a report on payday lending and, and, and followed up on a report that it had done um, the previous year. Prior to the early 80s and 90s, the, uh, most states uh, really restricted uh, uh, payday loans. That uh, It wasn't until the, until the mid 90s that uh, um, the payday loan industry began to grow and they, they did it using somatics to kind of circumvent the state's credit laws. Uh, they use check cashing as a, as a store as opposed to a payday loan store. They use the deferred presentation definition, which uh, allowed them to really have kind of an installment loan that really had high, high interest rates. And they didn't have fees, were not uh, considered to be interest. So they did things that uh, circumvented the laws that were in effect uh, from the regulatory standpoint to uh, um, continue to uh, create a market for um, their industry. By 1998, 32 states had regulated uh, payday loans and allowed payday loans. The uh, payday lenders uh, really kind of filled a void that was left by the banking and credit union and other financial mainstream uh, folks uh, leaving uh, communities and uh, not making um, low volume uh, loans to a lot of consumers. Um, their APRs on the um, payday loans, as uh, some have shown, have ranged from 700% to up to 2,000%. Uh, 
1998, by 1998, the payday loan industry uh, was doing about a billion dollars in volume. And today, uh, payday loans uh, run an estimated uh, 27 billion, and that's not even uh, looking at uh, the online payday lenders who um, we don't have a lot of statistical data on at this presently. I thought I'd look at Wisconsin and, and kind of give you a little history of how regulation and, and how the industry has grown in, in that state. And um, in 1993, we only had two companies with 14 licenses making payday loans in Wisconsin. They were licensed under one of the statute, but uh, the statute did not uh, specifically define a payday loan. Uh, the industry uh, continued to grow. By uh, 97, we had 46 uh, companies that were making payday loans, and, and by 98, we, we had, were up to 162 licensures. By 2000, the industry had greatly expanded. We had 524 uh, licenses that we had granted. They were making up to $1.7 million in loans, and uh, 1.7 million loans at a volume of $735 million in lending. Um, the federal government has now become involved, uh, certainly in the uh, uh, payday loan uh, regulatory uh, uh, function through its uh, new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, some of you may be aware that the uh, U.S. Army and military uh, engaged in a, a practice to eliminate payday loans for their own uh, uh, members and uh, were very proactive and very aggressive about that. With the uh, Dodd-Frank uh, legislation, the CFPB uh, has primary responsibility to, to establish federal regulation that will oversee um, the payday lending industry. They will be the primary supervisors, uh, supervisor of companies that make payday loans. Um, they will have the authority to regulate but not set usury limits for the payday loan industry. And the CFPB has been very outspoken uh, in terms of their intention to focus on the uh, payday lenders uh, in that industry. Now, in Wisconsin, uh, just recently in January of 2011, we, we passed Wisconsin Act 405, which uh, uh, affected the payday loan industry. It uh, defined payday loans by statute. It limited the rollovers uh, number per loan. And it uh, required that there was no interest after the maturity of that loan. And it required uh, payday lenders to use a common database. In July, uh, that act was uh, modified. And the changes um, allowed payday loans to be redefined to mean a transaction for a term of 90 days or less, meaning that if, in fact, it was uh, 91 days, then it no longer was considered a payday loan or regulated under that statute. It permitted interest after the maturity of a, at a rate of 2.75% uh, per month, and it required repayment plans only once every 12 months. The impact of those laws has uh, basically, through the use of our database, shown that the number of loans and the loan volume has been down since the modification to the law. We had uh, 194,000 loans compared to 1.2 million loans in 2010. Uh, we had $58 million in loans compared to $483 million in 2010. And moving ahead, we, we see some challenges, I think, in the industry. Obviously, as a regulatory body, we have to look at the industry and try to figure out uh, how do we regulate an industry without adversely affecting uh, the providers of that industry. Where do we find the balance? Um, we know that the typical uh, payday borrower remains in debt for much of the year, and many are indebted for extended periods. We know that the borrower's loans uh, have a propensity to increase in size and frequency as they continue to borrow. And significant numbers of the borrowers default on loans, triggering more fees and jeopardizing, you know, obviously their bank accounts. And our goal and our charge, you know, comes from the legislature. So one of the things that we see is will be important as the federal government begins their regulatory uh, 
actions that the state will probably follow those in suit and it may in fact modify how we regulate the industry. Um, certainly again as the two um, previous speakers have said, the challenge is to find a balance between uh, providing um, a needed commodity to the consumer and regulating it so that the consumer is protected. Great. Thank you, Ray. Now we're going to start the Q&A portion of the webinar, and I just want to thank people who have been submitting their questions. There's still time to submit more. Actually, we're going to start with one for Joshua. What are some of the best practices you are seeing for underwriting for the underserved? Does it include indicators to detect folks with chronic problems, such as those discussed by Justin? That's a good question. So I think uh, we've seen it on two fronts. Uh, I'd say more generally, one is figuring out a way to get a sense for what a person's income looks like and, and understanding exactly what their cash in and outflows um, uh, actually look like. Get a good picture of that and to be able then to then determine whether or not um, you know the loan repayments, whatever the debt servicing fees are actually going to be, are affordable. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to do. I think that's one of the advantages of the employer-based model. I mean, you have a very uh, good picture of the, the person's overall income. Uh, I think the account-linked idea, uh, it has the potential uh, to develop some underwriting practices that, based on the cash ins and outflows um, on the account, whether or not they've gotten that right or figured out a way to do that uh, effectively, um, I think, yeah, you know, that remains to be seen. Um, I also say a lot of the, the other underwriting methods, it's difficult to say exactly what they are because what they are doing is basing uh, their underwriting off of uh, uh, um, analysis of alternative data, alternative credit data. Um, so, for instance, Zcash. Uh, the, the founder of Zcash is actually um, Google's former chief uh, information officer. Um, so their kind of special sauce is effectively in their underwriting. They collect tons and tons and tons of data that's publicly available and have run it through all different kinds of machine learning tools and developed algorithms to kind of figure out how to effectively score someone um, without relying on that traditional underwriting uh, data, you know, the, the FICO scores or uh, some of the reports that are coming out of the three bureaus. So um, uh, Progressive Financiero, they've done the same thing, uh, not to the same extent, but they've developed their own underwriting system based on unique alternative data, um, and the same thing with bill flow. Uh, so the instance there, because that you know is really core to their business, it's, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly what that is. But I think it's um, you know I'm sorry exactly what those underwriting criteria are. They're, you know they're not going to tell people exactly what they're doing. Uh, but I think that experimentation, you know, the, the ability to refine that um, is definitely moving us in the in the right direction. But uh, overall, underwriting, you know, it, it goes back to the basics. Should really be gauging someone's ability to repay um, and, and their past credit history uh, and to, to determine their propensity to repay. Great. Justin or Ray, did you want to comment on that at all? No. Okay. So the next one, Justin, I think we'll start with you on this. How do you account for back-to-back -back loans? So a back-to-back -back loan is where you pay off the loan entirely and immediately reborrow. So that's a great question. So just to kind of summarize the question for people, we observe loans at this one store or this one set of stores and I was telling you a bunch of results about the fraction of people who repay versus renew those loans and the definition of renewal can get a little tricky for payday loans uh, because they may do something that the payday lender internally codes as renewal or instead they may technically pay off a loan and immediately take out a new loan uh, and so you could wonder what that might do in our setting. So in our setting, because we have all of the administrative data for a payday lender, we can define renewal in different ways. So we can look at it by saying, you know, a loan that was taken out within a day, for instance, of the closing of a last loan. We're still working on defining that for other windows. We might want to think about expanding that longer, but so far we haven't seen that mattering too much. Now the one thing that is key is that we don't know whether somebody re Fin pays off a loan at our place and goes somewhere else. So to the extent that that's happening, our repayment may be actually overstating things. So we said that 40% of people repay roughly. It may actually be lower once you take into account some of these alternatives. In terms of the conclusions of the analysis I was talking about today, that difference definition probably isn't going to have much impact. So there's no good reason to think that that type of behavior would differ very much for people who have different loan lengths. Uh, and so it probably doesn't change any of the 
the qualitative results that I was showing you today, but it may mean that we're slightly overstating the overall fraction of repayment once you consider the fact that some of these people may pay off a loan and immediately get someone somewhere, one somewhere else. Great. Okay, this next question is for all three of our panelists. In South Carolina, there are regulations in place to ensure that a person does not have more than one active payday loan. After making a payment, the person must wait 24 to 48 hours before renewing the loan. Are any other states exploring this similar option? Yes, there, there are a number of states. One, one of the key pieces to this, and I'll go back to the, the past question, is that those states, and I, I think there are roughly 16, there may be more, that have... Uh, a database that the payday loan industry has to report into, which allows the tracking of whether they took out a loan at one institution and then went somewhere else and, and, and took out another loan so that you would have some concrete data on, on that issue. But again, the piece becomes on the tracking, that we have some ability to know when people are taking out the loans and where the regulatory uh, boundaries are of how many of those loans they can take and what kind of rollover they can have within the restrictions of those, those states. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just add to that, I think in general there is this, this is one of the costs to rollover regulation. So in many ways you think that if the biggest concern is that people roll these over, the most direct regulation is to regulate the rollovers. But, you know, as the question sort of suggests and as uh, Ray's response highlights, there is a cost to this that it requires a lot of monitoring to do that. So if you have a competitive landscape of payday lenders, uh, you can't simply pass a law where you monitor a given payday lender because people can just go somewhere else. So you have to create this database. It involves a lot of active monitoring and tracking. So in terms of regulations, it may be one of the most direct to address the problem that people identify, but it's also somewhat costly. Right. All right, Joshua, I'm going to start with you for this next question. This is a question about privacy. Um, are the new online lending and products offered through kiosks bringing about privacy challenges and a challenge to regulate? Can you comment on this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, we haven't really seen too much on the privacy issue, but I think definitely on the online uh, portal, I think that's um, really anytime you're offering a financial product online, I think uh, making sure that you have the safeguards in place to keep individuals' um, information safe is important. And then there's also just the perception issue. Uh, does the consumer believe that your information is going to be kept safe? Uh, I think it's a challenge uh, to the online space because you really kind of have two different um, players operating there. There's a number of different, but if you really want to categorize them, there's uh, you know, some of the ones that I mentioned are uh, doing what they need to do in order to um, uh, operate under existing state regulations, trying to comply with, with all um, uh, existing laws that, that um, touch not only privacy issues but um, you know, general issues around lending in general, uh, overall. Uh, but then we're seeing that the online marketplace is, it's, you know, I've heard it referred to numerous times as kind of the Wild West right now. Um, there are a lot of providers who are offering loans, oftentimes in states where they're not regulated or licensed to do so, um, under terms which may not be favorable. Uh, I think during um, uh, the CFPB's payday field hearing, this is something they kind of talked about, where there are existing uh, payday lenders who are uh, violating some of those um, laws that are currently on the books, and it becomes very difficult, even more difficult to track those once you go online. So I think uh, when it comes to the consumer per uh, perception around privacy, uh, the participant of those players in the marketplace who, who may uh, be, be acting outside of the, um, the realm of the law, it, it makes it much more difficult to, um, to actually uh, uh, figure out. So, um, you know, in the retail kiosk, I think that it, it really operates much more like a retail outlet. I think they, they have the same safeguards that you would get um, in a – when I say kiosk, too, I should clarify that there's a person manning that, that spot. Um, so it operates very much like a, a typical retail uh, lender uh, lender's outlet. So you know they're they're maintaining the same protections there. Great. And Ray, could you just clarify one thing for us? Does the new law in Wisconsin prevent renewing a loan? You can do one rollover, and then you're prohibited after that. You have to wait a wait a period. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, here's one saying many of us are working with the military, active duty, guard, and reserves. Have there been any studies done showing what percentage of total payday loans are taken out by military versus general population? Or any resources that you could recommend for that information? So I'm not aware of one that shows that as the overall statistic you're looking for. There has been some studies of, uh, of 
payday lending use among the uh, military population and a couple of studies that have done sort of overall looking, uh, overall studies of payday loan activity that we could point you to. So one of the studies that looked at payday lending by military uh, individuals came from uh, Carroll and uh, Zinman. So, and I'm forgetting the year now, it's 2008 or 2009. So uh, I think we have your email on these questions so I could get you a specific one. But they studied uh, airmen in the Air Force, if I believe, uh, and looked at where they were located and whether the state that they happened to be based in allowed payday lending. And then they were able to look at that outcome on the airmen in a range of things. And they may have a couple of statistics in there. Uh, Ray may know some other sources of data on that. Um, but effectively, a lot of this has been not as studied recently because there's been regulation on the interest rates that can be charged to military families for payday loans that has really stifled the amount of payday lending going to military families as far as I understand it. That's correct. Uh, uh, although they, they tell me that the Army is re-looking at that uh, uh, that issue, but uh, I will look and see if we have some data and we'll answer to that email on, on that specific uh, topic. Great. Um, Ray, here's another one for you. <laughs> Is it true that many payday lenders, specifically in Wisconsin, have switched to an installment loan model? If so, how has that affected loan volume in the last few years? Well, payday lenders are able to license themselves under two separate chapters. The one chapter I cited uh, uh, defines what a payday loan is specifically. The other chapter allows uh, more of an installment loan, if that be the quote. Uh, many of them um, uh, are probably, uh, given that if, if we look at what's in our database now, and I told you that the volume has dropped, that there is the possibility that they are lending under the other section of the chapter and uh, in a more of an installment loan uh, model um, that has affected the volume. Because if you look at the 2011 volume, let me just give you a reference to other states. Um, if you take Indiana, which has a population of about a million, a population of about six million uh, four, um, very close to Wisconsin, their loan ratio under payday lending is about 25 percent. That's ratio of loans per per capita. Um, they have a volume of about one million five in loans. Uh, in Wisconsin, which has a population of uh, 5.6 million people. Uh, we're doing a volume of about 200,000 loans under the payday loan uh, statute right now, which is a, a ratio of loans per capita of 4%. Now, in fairness to the industry, the, the law changed in July. The data that we have is short term, obviously. So I think we need a longer longitudinal kind of study to look at that to see if that is the current trend. But uh, the, the, the quick answer to that, that question is that uh, the volume has, uh, is decreasing. Great. Okay, and we've got time for one more question. So let's go with, um, is the income interruption the main problem with paying a loan back? In other words, the interest and fees are troubling, but if someone doesn't have $400, for example, to cover something one week, how will they have it less than two weeks later and still cover their bills? Even if they can't roll it over, they'll need to borrow from the same or different store. Mm. Well, in, in many of the um, uh, situations, it's, the lenders are taking a check, so the folks borrowing have some source of income. They've got their check. The check is cashed, you know, at the point or post-dated or uh, at the point the loan comes due, which makes their payment, you know, timely. Um, that goes back to an earlier question, if in fact they are short of cash, so now that you've taken that payroll check and cash it, they've got to get another loan to cash flow themselves going forward. So um, I don't know if we have, you know, the, the, the real difficulty with this is that much of this is driven by emotion and, and public concern about the interest rates. The difficult part of that is that we don't have a lot of data to really make a data-driven, per se, uh, decision on what's happening, who's using, uh, and, and how it's occurring and how we might structure products going forward that would address 
um, the need for access to capital for a, a segment of this population. And I'll, I'll just add to that quickly. Um, I think studies like mine are pointing to this idea that there are just some sort of fundamentally base challenges for the population of people who are using payday loans that may have very little to do with the exact features of the payday loans. And so I think part of what this question is getting at is the question of where is the fundamental problem? Is it really with the structure of this payday loan or is it with the sort of financial lives of many of these individuals overall? And I think, you know, you could say the results of my study are consistent with the idea that many of the problems have roots that are outside of the payday lending. Uh, institutions. And so, you know, to that extent, some of the things that Joshua was mentioning about trying to think about financial literacy initiatives that help people to do better jobs of budgeting, that help them to reframe the way they think about their borrowing and living paycheck to paycheck, may be the more first order sort of policy thing than sort of small tweaks to interest rates and other things. And so I think that question is pretty well placed mm -hmm. that um, some of this research is pointing towards the, the basic problems being much more fundamental than the payday loans themselves. Great. Well, I'd like to thank Justin, Joshua, and Ray, and thank you to everyone for participating. Um, the archived webinar and the slides will be at cfs.wisc.edu within one week. And the next CF webinar is a CFS webinar is on Tuesday, March 13th. Monica Martinez of the New York City Office of Financial Empowerment will present research on the impact of financial counseling on financial security. You'll receive a registration email by the 1st of March. Thank you and have a great day.